my friend and I decided to drive from Philadelphia to Miami Beach. The car's block cracked in North Carolina. This was around 1975, although I could be off by 14 months or so. I thought it would be an adventure to hitchhike the rest of the way. I remember waiting all night on a godforsaken stretch of highway in Fayetteville, North Carolina. We got a 10 mile ride from some guy with a Prince Valiant haircut, who upon dropping us off said, I'll probably see you guys in the morning on my way to work. Nine hours later, sure enough, he picked us up in a station wagon filled with the vending machine sandwiches. We finally got to the area around the border with South Carolina. That's when a guy, the spitting image of Bundy in retrospect, stopped and asked us where we were going. When I said Miami, he said, what street? We were overjoyed that this young guy, older than us, was going to take us straight to my mother's house in Bay Harbor. Now, I cannot prove this person was Ted Bundy, but what happened was creepy. And I have researched a little and found this happened at the time after Bundy's prison break in Colorado, and at the same time he was supposed to have moved to Florida. Anyway, after we got in the car, he offered us a joint. He didn't want to have any, but told us to toke up. Well, whatever was in this joint was powerful enough to almost paralyze both of us. He then began to start playing with the buttons on the radio, switching stations compulsively almost every few seconds. I began to feel paranoid because I could sense some weirdness exuding from the sky. I was in the front seat and my friend in the back. We went to a rest stop and he disappeared into the bathroom for about one hour. When he finally got back to the car, he said he had a detour to his bank and he had started to take us through miles of small roads in Georgia. I remember seeing houses on stilts in marshland. He finally stopped in the most remote location where there was a single building that looked like an abandoned tavern. We were still stoned. He got out of the car and went behind this building. I remember seeing palm trees and was shocked that palm trees were so far north in Georgia. He got back in the car and he had these sunglasses on and I noticed that he seemed short as he walked back to the car. He said he had to now speak with his lawyer and began to talk about real estate law and the changes in the law that would allow development in this area. And so we drove for hours and hours until we got to Jacksonville. He pulled the car over on a strip mall like area and told us that there was a change in plans. We had to get out there. We were exhausted and hung over from the angel dust or whatever was in that joint. We saw a bus station and took a bus the rest of the way to Miami. As I think back, I am almost certain this man was Ted Bundy. I still see his face and the time frame and location were right. We were two men, so I don't think we were in any danger unless Bundy was considering killing men. I think he was just enjoying mind-fucking us. And that is my story. Years back, I made a late-night stop at a local Walmart on my way home from a friend's house. It was in a quiet area, not a lot of people out, and about nearly 1am. I've lived around there for years and never run into any truly criminal elements there. So I felt safe 
going to the store alone as a woman in my early 20s. I made eye contact with the teenage girl the second I walked in the door. She was parked on a bench by the restrooms, hugging a backpack in a small purse, checking her phone with a rather desperate expression on her face. When she looked at me, I could tell she was on the verge of panicking. After a brief second of staring at me, she went back to check her phone and making phone calls. At the other end of the bench was a white-haired man in jeans and a t-shirt. If I had to guess, he was probably in his late 50s or early 60s. Altogether, nothing appeared off about him. But what struck me was the fact that he never looked up as I passed. Instead, his eyes were absolutely glued to the teenage girl next to him. Not in a passive way, but like he was sizing her up for something. She was perched on the edge of the bench, angling herself away from his gaze and leaning away from him. Her body language screamed that she wanted nothing to do with him. Something about him set off warning bells in my head as I went about grabbing the items I had stopped for. I'm normally the type of person that mills about stores aimlessly, making a point to wander each aisle just to see what's on for sale. That night, however, I felt a pressing need to get in and out of the store as quickly as possible, and something in the back of my head told me to keep an eye on the man on the front bench. I moved my knife from my purse to the front pocket of my jeans, where it would be easily accessible. That's how uneasy I felt being in the same building as this man. As I purchased my items, I watched the pair on the front bench. The man had moved halfway across the space between them and was trying to chat with the young woman. She was shaking her head and offering one-word answers, looking like a rabbit about to bolt. As I walked past them again to leave with my purchases, she stopped me and asked if I was headed anywhere close to my old hometown. Apparently, she'd been on her way home from a trip with friends, and they had made a stop to grab drinks and use the restroom. She'd gotten separated from the group, and they left her at the store. The store was about a 30 minute drive from my old hometown, and I knew that to get home, she'd have to walk several hours along unlit stretches of rural highway. The man sitting next to her continued to leer at her, but refused to look my way. While I would normally have told the girl that I was headed the opposite direction, Something in the back of my head told me not to leave her alone with this man. I agreed to take her home, and she thanked me profusely and offered gas money and a cigarette. I refused both and took her home. The logical part of my brain reasoning that the girl weighed maybe 100 pounds and was about a full head shorter than I was, so if it came down to it, I could fight her off. I wasn't stupid either. I texted a few friends to let them know what I was doing, and they were not happy with me. The girl mentioned her address, and I knew exactly where she was talking about. It was an old, quiet neighborhood where I used to play little league baseball down the street and swim in the pool a few blocks away. During the drive, she told me that she just moved to the area with her mom and younger sisters from a larger city several hours south. She'd taken off with a few of her friends for the weekend and her mom hadn't expected her back until the following day. So she'd silenced her phone for the night and hadn't picked up when the girl tried to call. I vaguely remember something about her mom having to work early in the morning and none of the girl's sisters were old enough to have their own phones. We arrived at our destination, and the girl gave me a handshake 
and thanked me repeatedly, asking if there was anything she could do to repay me. And I told her, yeah, do me a favor, get better friends. Looking back, I have no idea what about that man creeped me out so much, but something about him and the way he was staring at that girl got my hackles up. I had thought, in passing, that he might have been waiting for someone else in the other store, perhaps someone using the restroom nearby. But upon checking out, it struck me that I hadn't seen any other customer there, so he really had no reason to be waiting on that bench. I was still living with my parents at the time, so when I got home, I woke my mom up and told her what happened. She hesitated, and I could see that she didn't like the idea of me giving a stranger a ride home. But in the end, she agreed that something had prompted me to take action, and that I might have saved that young girl from being harassed, or worse. This happened to me in September of last year. I was driving to my hometown from my current residence, which is about 180 miles away. I had gotten a late start, so the sun was setting when I left, and it was fully dark when I exited the interstate. I turned onto the highway that connected my hometown to the interstate. My hometown is a fairly small city, and the highway runs through a very rural part of my rural state, Tennessee. In the daytime, there's usually a few cars driving around because there's access to some nice boating areas off the highway. But at this time of night, and this time of year, the highway's basically deserted. Anyway, I noticed someone walking with a large backpack and sticking their thumb out. Being September, it was cold enough to make me feel sympathy for someone stuck walking outside. I'd stopped for hitchhikers a few times before then and never had any real problems. I even been able to help some people who were clearly in very bad spots in their lives. I remember feeling relieved when I stopped the car and got out because I saw the hitchhiker was an older lady. I'm a big guy, but I'm still nervous about being overpowered in situations like that, and I figured this lady would be a pretty safe ride to give. She looked like she was in her late 40s or early 50s, kind of a rounded face that was weathered and dirty, but not visibly messed up by drug use or anything like that. I helped her put her bag in the back of my car, and she thanked me profusely. The first thing I noticed is that her breath stank of alcohol. It didn't smell like beer, but some kind of liquor, strong enough to make me feel a little woozy when she was talking to me. It didn't really bother me that much, though. She seemed fairly lucid and... I don't think it's my place to judge a transient person for wanting to drink. I probably would too in that situation, but I remember it. I started driving down the road and we were talking. She seemed pretty pleasant. The fact that she wanted to make conversation eased my mind even more. She mentioned that she had been married before, but had separated from her husband several years ago. She talked about traveling from eastern U.S. to the western states several times and didn't seem too troubled by not having a permanent residence. At that point, I was happy to take her as far as I could, which was about another hour of drive time. Then, she started talking about strange things. The first thing she mentioned was that she had left her husband to follow God. This didn't faze me much, 
because this was in the Bible Belt and saying that you follow God or some such isn't too unusual. But as she kept talking about it, I realized that she had left her husband to follow the voice of God. Again, mental illness isn't very unusual in this kind of population and it's not something to stigmatize, so I tried not to let it bother me. But again, I was driving with a stranger on a deserted highway on a pitch black night and she was starting to talk about God, speaking directly to her. She started talking about her travels out west, which was where things got really strange. She described meeting an Arab man with olive skin on the side of the road. He wore a turban, had a beard, and held the leash of a white tiger. They looked at each other, neither saying anything. So she pretended to be a rock, and crouched down on the ground until he passed her. I was trying to politely make conversation, so I laughed and asked her, really? In a sort of prompting way. She nodded and started to pick up steam. Her voice raised and she started talking about hearing gunshots on the plains the day after her encounter with this man and his tiger. She looked up and saw seven wild horses race in front of her. By this time, I was getting a little nervous. And then she looked at me and said, Last week I saw a T-Rex. A T-Rex? I'm pretty sure I wasn't completely hiding the incredulity from my voice. Yes, she said. A mother and a child. She said that she had seen a gang of men seize the child from the mother and drive metal tie-down stakes into its hands and feet. This was because its eyes weren't open yet, and I presume it would be easier to control it that way. They were then pulling ropes through the tie-downs to hold it in place. I'm not sure whether it was the nightmarish scene she was describing, or her obviously debilitated mental state, but I decided right then to find a way to part with this woman. I spotted an intersection that led to a smaller east-west highway rather than the southbound one we were on right then. I told her, truthfully, that she could get to where she wanted to go more easily by taking that highway instead of the one we were on, but that I couldn't go that way. I suggested dropping her off at a nearby gas station and she agreed much to my relief. I stopped and felt reassured by the lights of the gas station and the presence of a clerk inside. She got out of my car and I removed her pack from the car. She returned to the passenger window and looked inside, thanking me for the ride. I responded appropriately. And then, she said the strangest thing of all to me. You remind me of my ex-husband so I want to give you a piece of advice. Go around Missouri, not through it. She left and I drove away. I'm determined to not do two things. Never meet this woman again, or go through Missouri. So this is one of the many stories my dad told me when I was a little girl about his adventures hitchhiking when he was a few years younger than my age now, 28. He's a super deadhead and him and a friend named John followed them on the road with nothing but their acoustics and some cash. Apparently, they got to Georgia at one point and were getting tired but needed to make it a few towns over in order to see the dead the following day. They walked miles and tried to catch a ride for hours to no avail. 
and started to lose hope when a beat up pickup truck stopped and let them in. My dad got in the front and John got in the back, thanked him and fell asleep, leaving my dad awake with this guy driving them. According to him, things were bad right from the start. The driver asked where they were headed and why they had guitars and asked if my dad knew how to play well. My dad told him about the Grateful Dead and how he did play and usually picked up a banjo but left it back home. So the guy gets super creepy and says, I've always wanted to kill me one of them guitar boys. My dad started freaking out at this point and said he just laughed it off but try to be as unnoticeable as possible while attempting to wake up John. Things kept getting more tense. He asked the guy if he'd mind pulling into a gas station. He said no. He asked how long until they would get to the next town. No response. And he eventually went completely silent. After a few hours of driving, with John waking up in the meantime, the guy got really eccentric and asked if they'd ever seen a bad death. He started driving the truck into mailboxes and street signs and eventually hit a stray dog while laughing maniacally. My dad and John laughed right along with him until he finally stopped at a gas station and they were able to get their things and take off. They ended up missing the show, but I'm glad my dad wasn't the guitar boy the guy was looking for. Okay, so I'll start off by saying my dad is a character. All of my friends loved him growing up because he could entertain you just by talking to him. This attitude is what initially led me to question the legitimacy of this story for a long time. Now that I'm a bit older, I could tell this one cuts deep every time we make him tell it. Usually, he talks in a very upbeat, active tone, but when my brothers and I first heard him tell this story, or talk about it in general, his tone completely changes. It's as if the color just rushes from his face. It's obvious he doesn't enjoy talking about it. Okay, now to the story. He was about 18 at the time. From pictures, he seemed like an athletic, approachable teen. He was living in the Gary slash Whiting area of Northwest Indiana. Sometime later in the evening, my dad, who's been a smoker for roughly 50 years of his life, decides to hitchhike to his local convenience store. He has a knack for talking about places or events as if you were there. An odd thing to do, considering the shop was only a couple miles away from his house. Eventually, a truck pulls to the side of the road. It was a baby blue pickup truck, to be exact. Apparently, there were two men in the truck, probably both in their 40s or so, pretty normal looking to him. He said that the driver was a bit burly and sort of looked like Jackie Gleason. The truck was only a three-seater, so the man in the passenger seat had to move to the middle. No word spoken apart from the driver asking him where he was going. This didn't strike my father as odd, so he proceeded to sit in silence, not suspecting anything. Suddenly, out of nowhere, one of the guys randomly burst into laughter. According to my father, this wasn't your ordinary laugh, but something much more diabolical. 
Surely enough, the driver looks at my father with what he claimed was the devil's eyes. Now, chiming in with the laughter, as you could suspect, they start to go a different route. My dad knew they weren't heading anywhere near the desired destination. He was trying to play it cool, wait for his chance. Luckily, a couple minutes later, they finally hit a red light. The driver slowly crept his arm across the cab and starts caressing my dad's neck. I guess his fight or flight kicked in and a surge of adrenaline came about. He unlocked the door and bolts out, no looking back. He said he hid near a local church and watched as they drove around looking for him. Some years later, my dad was watching the news when the mugshot of a man popped on the screen. His heart sunk. The man was undoubtedly the same man who had picked him up hitchhiking. That man was John Way Gacy. When I was a teenager, I lived in a small town located about 30 miles south of Atlanta, Georgia. I did not get my driver's license or my first car until I was almost 20 years old. So between the ages of 16 and 19, I hitchhiked frequently. This was in the early 70s when people still hitchhiked and many drivers were still willing to pick people up. In spite of the dangers and risks posed to both driver and rider, for the most part, I've never had any trouble with the people who offered me the rides. But occasionally, I would get picked up by someone who would totally creep me out. This is a story about one creepy ride I accepted and how 25 years later, I would discover to my great shock that I may have been much luckier at the time than I have ever imagined. This incident occurred sometime in the summer of 1974, when I was 17 years old. At the time, I was 6 foot tall, 175 pound, blonde hair and blue eyed guy, who did not have any trouble connecting with girls for dates. In fact, my story begins with me standing on the outside of a highway with my thumb out as I was trying to get back home after spending the weekend with my girlfriend who lived in downtown Atlanta. I was traveling south, away from the city and out into the country where I lived with my parents. I recall that I only had my thumb out for about 15 minutes when a man in a big white Lincoln town car a very large and expensive car at the time, pulled over. As I walked up to the car, I scanned the inside and looked at the driver, trying to size the situation up, as I always did, just to be safe. And what I saw was a tidy car with a man in the driver's seat who looked to be in his late thirties or mid forties, dressed in an expensive suit and tie. He had short black hair, wore black rimmed eyeglasses, and appeared to be rather on the thin side, with a gaunt face and dark eyes. I never learned his name, but for the sake of the story, we'll call him Town Car Man. When I got up to the passenger side of the car, I leaned down toward the open window and told him where I was headed to, and asked him if he was going that far. To which, he replied he was, in a soft voice, and waved me into the car. I was not at all wary of him, as by all appearances, he was just an ordinary middle class businessman. And I opened the door, and got into the front seat next to him, 
without any hesitation. Generally, when I accepted rides from strangers while hitchhiking, I liked to try and engage them in chat, sort of as a way to pay them for the ride by providing good conversation and also to put them at ease about picking me up by showing them that I was harmless and not a creep. Even though I felt that I did not look all that dangerous, only if you could call having long hair and dressing in the hippie fashion of the time dangerous. However, when I began trying to chat with town car man in my normal fashion, with typical small talk, as I instantly started getting bad vibes from him, as I could tell that he was mostly ignoring what I was saying, and instead kept trying to steer the conversation toward asking me personal questions about myself, such as how old I was, where I went to school, if I had a girlfriend, etc. I tried to answer his questions as politely as possible, without really giving away much real information. But Town Car Man kept getting more and more personal, asking questions that hinted whether or not I was sexually active with my girlfriend, telling me that when he was my age, he went around horny about half the time and had always been on the lookout for sexual adventures, ha ha ha. As the ride progressed and we were going further and further out into the country, I began to get very uneasy as I started to sense that something was not quite right with him. We had left the populated city behind and were now traveling down an old two-lane highway through countryside that was sparsely populated. There seemed to be hardly any other cars on the road. The more that town car man continued to ask me questions about myself, wanting to know very personal things about me, like if I ever had sex with my girlfriend, all while glancing over at me from time to time with a sort of creepy, knowing look in his eye, as if he was privately enjoying some dirty secret that only he knew about, the more uncomfortable I became. I don't know how better to describe it than that, and it really began to make me feel uneasy, as his manner seemed very cagey, and I totally sensed that there was some underlying motive to his questioning. It really put me on guard, and I began to think about what I should do next, as in, should I ask him to pull over and let me out, even though I was only about half the way to my destination and out in the middle of nowhere. For the first time, I began to realize just how vulnerable I felt, but what really made me start to feel uneasy was when he started asking me if I wanted a drink of liquor indicating that he had several bottles with him in the trunk and that if I wanted some, he would pull over to the side of the road and mix me up a stiff drink. Because I was growing more and more uncomfortable, I declined his offer, saying that I did not drink, which was a lie, as even at that age, I was already regularly drinking with friends, but he would not take no for an answer and kept insisting that I should really just have one drink. Because he was such a great drink mixer and it would only take a minute for him to fix a very special one for me. After I declined this offer for something like the fourth time, he abruptly changed tactics again and began telling me a story about when he was my age and a young guy in the army, and how he used to hitchhike a lot too, and that he would sometimes get picked up by men who wanted to pay him money to have sex with them, ha ha ha, and had anything like that ever happened to me. By this time, I had had quite enough of all this, 
and I looked him straight in the eye and said, No, that has never happened to me, and nobody had better ever offer that to me. Well, the knowing look vanished instantly from his face, and I could tell that he was totally irked by how I had just reacted to his story. That exchange between us totally changed the dynamic inside the car, and he became very quiet. After a few minutes of this uneasy silence, he spoke up and told me that he was turning at the next intersection and that I would need to get out there, even though he had told me when he first picked me up that he was going my entire way. At this point, I was actually very relieved and now only wanted to get out of the car. When the car came to a stop, I had just barely gotten out of the car and pushed the door closed when he stepped on the gas and zoomed off, literally jerking the handle of the car out of my hand. I remember that I stood there watching him drive away until he had disappeared down the road and that my heart was beating very fast. I was both scared and angry at what had just happened. After I had calmed down, I resumed hitchhiking until I got under the ride that took me home without further incident. Fast forward 25 years, it's 1999 and I had all but forgotten about my creepy ride with Town Car Man. I'm on the internet reading through a true crime website when I stumbled onto a story about a ultra creepy guy named Robert Bennett. A man who had been arrested after a series of vicious attacks on men whom he had picked up in his car, drugged, handcuffed, and then set their genitals on fire with a flammable liquid. The attacks took place over a 20 plus year period, starting around 1968 in the Atlanta area and ending with his arrest in 1991. Prior to Bennett's arrest, this attacker became known as the Handcuff Man and talk within the local gay community was that he was targeting men whom he thought were gay prostitutes. When I saw the photo of Bennett that accompanied the article, my jaw literally dropped open and the memories of my ride that day in 1974 came flooding back. I was certain I was looking at the picture of Town Car Man and I was absolutely floored. I do not have any way to prove that the creepy guy who picked me up was in fact this Robert Bennett. But the physical resemblance, what I remember about Town Car Man and the photo of Bennett is absolutely uncanny. And the persistent offer by Town Car Man to mix me a special drink and his questions about whether or not I've ever had sex with men for money also seem to indicate that possibility. I should point out that even though this story took place in the early 70s in the deep south of Georgia, I was actually okay with gay people at the time and even knew a few people back then who were gay. So I did not have a problem with homosexuality at all and still don't. But being heterosexual, I also had zero interest in having sex with other men. And even if I had been game for that sort of thing, I always found it highly distasteful when people assumed that they could act in such an unwanted, cagey fashion regarding sexual matters with complete strangers. I always have, and always will, find that to be extremely creepy. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Hopefully you've enjoyed the video. Go on and hit the like button and subscribe too. The hitchhiker theme was suggested by one of our subscribers. If you have anything in particular that you want to hear, go on and pop it in the comments. Thanks again guys.
and I'll catch you in the next one.